Northside, will you stand with me right now for the reading of God's word together? If you're able, let's stand together as we read from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 7. And here's what God says. Shout it out loud. (laughs) Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you've not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you've not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. And You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? The people question God. Why do you not see us? God, why do you not notice us? God, why are you not answering our prayers? And God responds with a question back. Why are you not seeing them? Why are you not noticing them? Those who are poor and hungry, those who are naked and not clothed, those who are under the yoke of oppression, those who desperately need to be freed, who are bound by chains, why do you not see them? Is this not what a fast ought to be. Isn't a fast the opportunity to listen to God, to submit to him, and to obey? God says your worship, it's hypocritical. You don't see what I see. You're not doing what I've commanded you to do. You're going through the motions of worship while those around you are suffering and you do nothing. That is how God defines worship. God defines for us what he means when he says fast. That's what we're going to look at today. In fact, you can be seated as we do. What does God mean when he describes worship? He gives his own definition, even to what it means for true fasting. We think of it as going without food. Humbling ourselves for a day in prayer. Here's what God says. This is what fasting is for me. To loose the chains of injustice. To untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free. To break every yoke. To share your food with the hungry. To provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, clothe them. And not turn away from your own flesh and blood. This is the kind of fasting that God desires. Not that you hit each other and strike and fight with each other. Not that you exploit your workers. These are all the things God says. When you refuse to care for the needs of those around you, God makes it very clear You're not experiencing true worship or fasting. It's hypocritical. And you know, I have to be honest. Sometimes when I'm evaluating my worship of God, 
I tend not to think of those things. My mind tends to drift to, to singing in worship, praying, yes, fasting, going without food for a period of time. I, it, it tends to drift to my Bible reading or my prayer life or my devotional or whatever it is that I'm thinking about. That's how I evaluate my worship. But in Isaiah 58, as God talks to his people, he says, is not the fast I desire the one where you look to the needs of those around you. In fact, Jeremiah 22, 16 says that God will evaluate your relationship to him by looking at your personal involvement in meeting the needs of people around you. Jeremiah 22 says this. Isaiah 58 says this. That, that when I care for the hurting around me, I'm demonstrating that my heart is beating with God's heart. But the fact is, sometimes brokenness and needs that are around us are sometimes like a spider web in the attic. You know it's probably there, but you're not necessarily going up there to look at it. You're not trying to get in close proximity to it. Sometimes it's better just to be out of sight, out of mind. But when it comes to brokenness and, and the lost and, and poverty and poor and needs around us. Sometimes it's kind of like that. We're, we're not sure we want to go there and look at it or get too close to it. But what we're seeing from Isaiah 58 right here is that we are to, first of all, look for the broken, see them. Look for the broken, see them. You know, I, I think it's appropriate for me to give you some statistics about the community in which we live right here around us so that we can see what, what God sees. Like, for example, maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, that right here in this greater Springfield area, persons in poverty is 22.9% of people are in poverty. You know what the national average is? 11.4. There is a far greater issue of poverty going around us right here than we realize under the age of 18 in poverty, 24%. Those 18 to 64 in age, 25.2% are in poverty. Only 28.5% in our community have some kind of college degree, which is interesting when you think of, of the number of colleges that we have and, and the numbers of, of college students that are here. A community focus report in 2021 said that the Ozark Health Commission said that children are the most vulnerable population that we have for health disparities based on socioeconomic class or demographic group. That of Greene County's 92,035 children, that Greene County ranked 70% more vulnerable than children in other counties. We have some needs here. Greene County averages 36 children entering into the foster care system every month. And because of that, Greene County has 735 foster care kids on an average day. And in fact, in 2020, more than 1,000 came through the foster care system in 2020. And that's growing. Greene County has a 96% a unique rate. What that means is, is as kids go into foster care, these are not the same kids over and over. These are new kids Overwhelmingly new ones entering into the foster care system. When it comes to families, 38% own a home in Springfield. Only 38% own a home in Springfield. Which what I find interesting about that is that 67% of people own a home in the state of Missouri. That means in the community in which we live, far fewer actually have home ownership. And in the impoverished community, there's a lack of safe, affordable housing because of an aging housing stock. We could go on to talk about the negative trends we see right now with increased crime rates or the opioid crisis. I mean, in fact, I looked at a map that showed where the most calls for, for emergency personnel for the opioid crisis was in Springfield, and, and it gave a map where it showed the green, yellow, and then it had the red hot spot where the most calls came from, and that is at Glenstone and Kearney just south of our church here, two miles away. We could talk about how the, about child abuse has been on the rise or, or how in the, in the 2021 county health rankings, Greene County residents average 4.9 days in a 30-day period in which they are mentally unhealthy, which is higher than the state average. It's higher than the national average. Just looking 
of what's going on around us, just right here in our community in the greater Springfield area, is a starting point for us, for us to be able to, to according to God's word, be able to see them, to, to notice them. God, why are you not seeing us? And God says, why are you not seeing them? Why are you not noticing them? We got to start by seeing them, noticing them, seeing the broken. It's why in recent years, we as a church, as we've become more and more aware of these things, we've tried to partner even with organizations in our community that are trying to do something about this. We've partnered with Foster Adopt Connect uh, because of how they are entering into this problem. We've partnered with CASA, of which I know a number of you are CASA volunteers. And it's why every year we take offerings from Thanksgiving to to December for the one less gift offering so we can give to these needs in our community, of which this past year we gave $10,000 to Victory Mission for the restoration program, which takes a man or a woman through an entire year of transformation so they can begin to be productive and on their own and have their feet under them. And the exciting news about that is of the 33 people that have gone through their restoration program to date, uh, 28 of those are doing great, are are thriving. It has an incredible success rate of which our $10,000 will take a man or a woman through an entire year of that to get them uh, experiencing new life. We, we've, we've partnered with people to do this. We've, we've used our One Less Gift offerings also to partner with Cross Lines to help with the needs in our community. It, it, it is why this week, on Thursday and Friday, we are so honored that we get to host the, the Charity Summit right here at Northside, a True Charity Summit. And the True Charity Summit is a two-day conference that equips churches and nonprofits on how to fight poverty effectively. There are better ways to do it than others. And they are going to talk. They're going to have sessions covering outcomes development, strategic fundraising, volunteer recruitment, hand-up alternatives rather than handouts, and the difference, and how we actually bring honor to those who are in need instead of perpetuating the problem. And one of the things I just want to, I mentioned a couple weeks ago about this, but I want to remind you of it because we've got room for you. There's room for any of you to come. And because we're hosting, there's a discount for you. So there's already a group of us that's going to come to this, but you can get a discount to come and and you can get information about this by going to the truecharity.us slash summit 2022. You can see it on the screen there and put in this discount code, which is 22 summit NCC. And you'll get a discount uh, on your registration to come and attend that Thursday, Friday. Get in on as much of it as you possibly can. You can go to that website to see the schedule. But, but why are things like this so important? Why, why are we talking about these things? Why would Isaiah 58, as we read through the Bible this year, and we're now in the prophets, why would we be bringing this up? Because unless you are personally involved, unless you are doing something, about removing, as God says here, yoke of injustice and impression or helping the poor and the homeless and the hungry, then our worship is hypocritical. Unless we are personally involved, God won't respond in the way that you want him to. If you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, the greatest commands of God, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This sums up all of the commands of God. And if we would do this, here is the result in verses eight through 12. Isaiah 58 says, if you would do this, then then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear and then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger, the malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in the sun-scorched land and he will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of street dwellings. If you would act rightly 
if you act justly, those two words, righteousness, justice, that, that Alan talked to us about last week, if you would do this, then God will bless you with light and healing and spiritual restoration and protection from trouble as the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And he will answer your prayers and you'll receive guidance from the Lord. The blessings are so numerous. If you would see, see the broken. And if you would next get in proximity to the broken, if you would be with them, to help them, you gotta be with them. You gotta be in proximity to them. I mean, in case you think this is just an Old Testament command, just look at Jesus. Look what Jesus did and do what Jesus did. And when you look at Jesus, here's what you're always going to find, is that if you follow in the footsteps of Jesus, where do those footsteps lead? I like the way Josh Howard says it. The footsteps of Jesus will always lead us to the lost and the broken and to cross. The footsteps of Jesus will always lead us to the lost, to the broken, and to a cross. And when we follow in those footsteps of Jesus, we will find ourselves in the dark places of our community where Jesus would go. We will find ourselves where there's the most pain, the most heartache, where there's lostness all around us. Do you hear? Are you drawing close? On Monday, Angela Highfield, who's coming up here, she grew up here at Northside. She was a global worker in Thailand until she was forced to leave during COVID. Uh, she's now been working with Burl Health, and uh, which is, I don't know if you knew this about Burl Health, it's one of the largest mental health providers in the nation. And uh, she's a part of that right here in Springfield, Missouri. And we asked Angela to come and to talk to us because we had heard how Angela's been addressing some of these things and doing some training, specifically as it relates to human trafficking, uh, not just in our nation, but in our area. And so we asked her to come and talk to us and we were blessed by it and learned a lot about it. And when we think about setting the oppressed free and removing the yoke and the chains of oppression. You can't help but think about this thing, which is becoming so much more prevalent. And so, uh, first of all, uh, let's just welcome Angela up here. I want to thank her for coming and sharing with us today. And I just want to ask a few questions. And, and the first, well, first of all, just tell us uh, what do you do there? What's your title at Burl? Yeah, I am one of the outpatient care coordinators. Um, it's kind of an executive producer role. Um, we work to ensure that clients are getting the best care and also that we're providing for our providers as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things you talked to us about is just what is human trafficking? And so uh, go ahead and just share this. What is it? What is human trafficking? Uh, the United Nations has a great definition, which is on the screen behind me, but essentially it is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, um, harboring or receipt of persons. Um, this can be threat, force, coercion, um, abduction, fraud, deception. So kind of what that, that boils down to is um, using someone for personal gain, so through labor or through sex trafficking. Um, and it is, um, you know, through coercion, so... Um, that could be drugs, that could be other, you know, things gained for that person uh, that can be through threat, uh, kidnapping, that sort of thing. One of the things you talked about is just how prevalent it is. And uh, in our nation, and then obviously it's growing here too. Tell us a little bit, how prevalent is human trafficking? Uh, human trafficking is the second fastest going, growing uh, crime behind uh, the drug trade. Um, human trafficking brings in about $150 billion a year. Um, it's estimated that the drug trade makes about 200000 So it's, it's slowly, uh, sorry, $200 billion, yeah. Um, it is quickly increasing. And with COVID, um, the last couple of years of being in this pandemic, it has increased even more because of that. Mm -hmm. You, uh, one of the things that was mentioned was, uh, there was like, there was like four, it's estimated, I know, but like 40 million, you said, yeah. uh, those trafficked in our world. Yeah. So it's roughly, again, estimated 40 million. We don't know the exact number because there's so many things that are still hidden and cases that don't go reported. Um, but that kind of breaks down a little differently. Here in the U.S., it's 403, uh, four, what did I say, 403,000 um, that are trafficked within the U.S. Um, if you've ever been to JQH, uh, been in that arena, gone to a graduation, a game, that, that arena holds 11,000 people. 
the number of people that are trafficked into the U.S. from outside of the U.S. is 17,500. So that's more than that arena alone can hold. Um, that number, again, breaks down to about 1.3 per every 1,000 people within the U.S. has been trafficked. One of the things you talked to us about was just, uh, you know, that there's a lot of myths when it comes to human trafficking. So just share this, what are some of those misconceptions about it? A lot of people think it can't happen in their community. It can't happen here. We're a small town. We're, you know, in the Bible Belt. Um, a lot of people think it doesn't even happen in the U.S. or that it only happens in cities. Um, another myth people think is that it only happens to women and children. Um, but in fact, anybody at any point can be trafficked. Uh, you also talked about some of the red flags we could be looking for just so we can see it. I mean, I think sometimes for people it's just like, man, I, you know, if it's that prevalent, if it's around here, and it is here, uh, but I'm not seeing it. What are some of the red flags we, we could be looking for if we try to look more intentionally? Uh, one of the, the red flags would be is if somebody's living with their employer um, or they're living in cramped conditions. Um, you know, there's, you know, 15 people to one, you know, small room, that sort of poor living conditions. Um, they're eating where they're sleeping. They don't have access to their um, identification records. So whether that's an ID or passport, that kind of thing. Um, also physical abuse, um, is a huge one. If you signs of physical abuse, I know that also goes into domestic violence as well. Um, if they're under 18 and in prostitution, that's another one. Um, or if they're being unpaid or paid very little. So you mentioned under 18. So when it comes to minors, uh, obviously this is a big issue for that too. What, what are we looking for with minors? Yeah, 90% of minors who are trafficked are runaways. Um, and so things to look for in that situation, I know we've got a lot of uh, you know, schools around here, high schools, things like that. Um, so if you are in you know, contact with those kids, look for, look for changes in behavior. Um, so that may be you know, becoming over-sexualized behavior or they're, they're starting to dress over-sexualized, they're missing school, there's unexplained absences, like strange you know, things are happening in their behavior. Another thing, another big one too is tattoos. Traffickers will use barcodes or dollar signs often to brand their victims. Mm. Yeah, we've heard that as a growing, I mean, a big time issue for them as well. And um, one of the things that you mentioned to me that uh, surprised me a little bit was just, you know, how many people who are trafficked are in contact at times with people who can help. Tell us about that statistic as it relates to our healthcare industry that you knew about? 80% uh, of, of those who have been trafficked will come into contact with somebody in healthcare. So that could be an ER, doctor's office, clinic, eye doctor, mental health facilities, um, that sort of thing. And roughly only 2% of those of, out of that 80% will be identified as somebody who's been trafficked. My in-laws put me on to a video I was watching last night, which was incredibly wrecking and moving about Megan uh, a girl who had been trafficked from the time that, that she was a toddler and, um, and groomed for that in sex trafficking. Obviously, that led her into prostitution. It, it led her uh, into drugs, stripping, all these things. I mean, that, that was her story and her journey. She goes to Life Choices in Joplin where Carolyn, the director there, knew about this statistic that Angela's talking about, had already made a kind of, we've got to find ways to identify and help these people to a greater degree. Through that process, we're able to listen to Megan, befriend Megan. Several ladies were able to come alongside of her in this journey that's just heart-wrenching, including in that story as her just talking about, you know, there's this perception from people, if you're stripping and in prostitution and doing drugs, then just you know, leave, get out of it. And she just said, you, you just can't imagine how impossible that is for them. That the one time she did leave and try to get out of it, uh, her trafficker found her, beat her to a pulp to such a degree that the doctor in the ER said that for someone who stayed alive, he had never seen anybody beat in his 10 years of doing this more than she was. And uh, just the amount of abuse that she was going through, but she was with a friend who um, knew that she already had an aversion to religion and Christians to some degree and just said to her, hey, I've really been wanting to watch this thing called The Chosen. You know, would you watch it with me? And she agreed that she would watch it. And the first episode was Mary Magdalene. And she connected with Mary Magdalene big time. And through that process over time, she became a believer this, this uh, past year. And... Um, and part of that story is how they just came alongside her and loved her and loved on her. 
Um, she went in, even into a process of having her tattoos that had the names or her nicknames they used for her or things like you're discussing. Uh, she had those covered up with new ones that she had designed uh, to show that she was a new person with a new identity. And as I'm watching this video and hearing this story, and I, you can't watch it without crying, all of a sudden as they're talking about the people in her life, there's a picture of her standing right here in front of this baptistry with a little girl. I don't know that story. I didn't know she was here until I watched the video last night and said, that's, she was right here. That's how close this is to us. We need eyes to see it. Uh, we need to know it. Um, I know that you were talking about some of the places here where we might have our eyes open. What would that be? Uh, one of the, the big ones over here is on Kansas and I-44. There's the Walmart over there. That's one of the highest trafficked Walmarts in the nation. So, because you can get in and out of that Walmart parking lot with ever, without ever being noticed. Um, there's several other hot spots in town over on Glenstone. As you're driving south, there's Evangel, and then there's a couple of uh, motels right there. Those are some of the biggest trafficked motels in Springfield as well. Um, like you mentioned, too, over here on the north side with the opioid crisis, that also goes hand in hand with the human trafficking crisis as well. So it's here. And, you know, one of the things I thought would be helpful for us to talk about as well is just, just who, well, first of all, before I tell you who these traffics are, if you want to see Megan's story, just go to YouTube and then just Google Megan, Mary Magdalene, or the chosen with M-E-G-H-A-N, Megan, and it will come up and you can watch that 27 minute story. But also just tell you, who are these traffickers doing this? Who are they? So there's no one single profile for, for traffickers. I can't say this is what a typical trafficker looks like. It can be community members, community leaders, police, fire, you know, fire department, uh, doctors. I mean, it can be anybody. Um, and that's, you know, that's the hard thing to be able to identify. Um, but that is why you kind of have to look out for these signs of what's going on in your community and kind of keep your eyes open because it is hard to identify what a typical trafficker would look like. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that we were talking about is just, you know, how does this happen? So how do, how do, how are they getting people into being trafficked? Yeah. So like I mentioned, coercion is a big one. Um, so drugs, um, that, that's very, obviously very prevalent here in our community. Um, so the promise of drugs or the promise of, you know, whether it's nice clothes, nice, nice things, a better life. Um, another one too, especially with COVID, we've all been shut away and we're, we're really craving human contact. We're craving being around people. And so people have often turned to social media, to those kind of things. So it's not actually, you know, even face to face, it's happening online. Um, another one too is, is it is happening through kidnapping. It is happening, you know, in those uh, situations as well. What are some of the questions, if we think we're maybe in a situation where we're seeing something, what are some of the questions we can ask that would help us say, okay, this is something that needs to be engaged? Several questions you can ask. Are you living with your employer? Um, do you, you know, do you eat where, eat and sleep where you work? Um, are, do you have access to your identification documents? Are you, you know, are you being paid? What is, what are you being paid? What, is, what you know, what are you making? Um, questions like, you know, have you been threatened? Has, you know, has your family been threatened? Um, are you in danger? You know, are you in debt to your employer? Um, and those obviously don't have to be that scripted. These are, com these are questions that you want to work into your conversation as you're, as you're talking with somebody. Um, but even just those basic kind of, you know, questions about when you're getting to know somebody can be key indicators for, for identifying somebody who's being trafficked. So if we're in a situation where we see something and we think something could be going on in this moment or we're concerned about it, what can we do? Call 911. Uh, that's, you know, if there's an emergency happening right there, obviously, please call 911. Um, there are also some other resources. There is a national human trafficking hotline. If you're, you know, if you suspect something is going on, um, call them. They will get you in touch with the right resources. Also, the Missouri Highway Patrol has done a lot of human trafficking training over the last couple of years, um, and they're working to get a task force together. Um, they do have an emergency and a non-emergency line, which is both are the, of them are posted on their website. Um, so if something is happening where it's an emergent situation, please call that emergency number. Um, and you know, if it's something where you got more questions. Um, if you call that non-emergency line, they will get you in contact with the right people. And then also you're here today. And so you're going to be out here in our lobby afterwards so people could talk to you as well yeah. further about Yes, it. I'd love to, to talk with you guys more if you guys have more questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate it. Can Thanks, we just guys. thank Angela right now for sharing with us? Grateful, grateful for that. 
I was so appreciative of Angela just sharing some of these things because sometimes we just have to have our eyes opened and see where is the hurting and the broken and the needed. Yes, we listen. We start there. We listen. We see. We want to see them. And we want to feel what, what they need. And we want to get in close proximity to them. That, that's how we can begin to do something about it is by being with them, seeing them. But there's this other thing we've got to do. Number three is we need to act on behalf of the broken. We need to do for them. Do for them. And what I mean by that is when I think of Matthew 25 where, where Jesus says, what you did not do for them, you did not do for me. And what you did do for them, you did for me. As he talks specifically in that context about other brothers and sisters or, uh, of, who, who knew the Lord, uh, who loved God, that they weren't taking care of their needs. They were experiencing pain and brokenness. And they weren't doing anything about it. Do for them what Jesus would do for them. It's not, it's not a matter of we just see it. And it's not a matter of just getting close to it be in, in proximity to it. We, we've got to do, we, we need to act on their behalf. It's like in Galatians 2, whenever Peter, James, and John talked to the apostle Paul and realized that, man, he is spreading the gospel even among the Gentiles. And they say, hey, there's one other thing we want to ask of you. And What's that? Remember the poor. And Paul said, I was glad to hear it. This I was eager to do. I mean, even Jesus was poor and had no place to lay his head and came from a poor family and it, it knew what it meant to be in need and he wants us to help meet other people's needs. When I say do for them, I'm talking about in this moment doing biblical justice for them. What God says is right. What God says is true. Injustice can be fueled by five things, perhaps more, but here's five to think about. When injustice has happened, the first one is fear. Think Pharaoh with the Israelites. He became afraid of them because they became numerous. What did he do? He put them in slavery. Think of Herod in Matthew chapter 2. He became afraid that a, a young boy would grow up to be king. So what did he do? He killed every boy two years and younger in that vicinity. 1 John 4.18 says, No fear in love. Love casts out fear. But fear is why we see injustice. There's another reason. It's prejudice. In John chapter 4, the disciples wanted to go around Samaria. Why? Because they were, they were prejudiced of the people of the Samaritans. Number three is greed. Ahab, he wanted a vineyard next to him, and so he came and took it from an innocent man. Greed, getting what I want, what I desire, the lust of the eyes and the flesh. Greed is a reason for injustice. Another one is ignorance, just not knowing we can feel injustice when we don't know about it. We, we, we don't see it. We don't understand it. Sometimes we don't even know systems that are in place. We don't we even know are helping to fuel it. In Matthew 25, people say to Jesus, we, we, we didn't know you were hungry. We didn't know that you were in need. And Jesus said, what you did not do for the least of these, they were all around you. You did not do for me. It was there. Either you didn't see it or you chose not to see it. There's another reason, which is apathy. Apathy fuels injustice. All throughout the Bible, we see people who saw needs, but they didn't do anything. We, we see it take place over and over again. Even think of the blind guys that were calling out to Jesus for mercy, and the disciples were shushing them. Or think about the children who came to Jesus to play, to be in his lap, and they were pushing them away. Jesus demonstrates for us what biblical justice looks like. He shows us God's heart. He's a model, an example to follow. And, and when it comes to justice or doing what is right and setting a press free, here's the thing. You, you, you need to make sure that you're always aligning yourself with biblical justice. It is the best solution. It is the best solution every time, biblical justice. Because justice without God, it always falls short. Back in October, in October 18th of 2020, I gave a sermon. It was entitled The Tears of the Oppressed from Ecclesiastes. We were going through that book. And in that sermon, I cited an article by Tim Keller that I was finding incredibly helpful at that moment. It's still very helpful to me today. And it was entitled this, A Biblical Critique of Secular Justice and Critical Theory. It was an incredible article where he presents the various biblical uh, where he, he presents biblical justice and what that looks like. And then he presents the primary four views of secular justice that have been in existence and what those look like, sound like, what they believe. And uh, whenever he 
did this and talked about this, he was showing the spectrum of secular justice theories. And that's what's on the screen here. Where on the far left, uh, you have individualism, where you're wholly the product of your individual choices, wholly. And the libertarian view of social justice or justice is, comes into play. On the far right is collectivism, where you are wholly the product of social forces and structures. And postmodern critical theory falls there, and then you can see the span between them. So you've got libertarian, liberal, utilitarian, postmodern, and just does a great job of showing us what secular theories of justice look like. Probably in your life, whether it's some other time or even now, you're probably finding yourself leaning towards one of these theories when you think about how it's going to play. But what he does a great job of addressing is that every one of these, is not only what every one of these theories believe, but also he talks about the shortcomings of them. And then how each theory diverts from Scripture, from biblical justice. And, and I just value that because it's helpful for us to remember we need to come back to biblical justice, not all the secular theories that are out there. And his article spends most of the time on the newest one that's really come on to the scene. It, it is drawing from old pedigree, drawing on the teachings of Karl Marx, but the postmodern critical theory, others of you have probably heard it more like CRT, but he talks about that as well, how that postmodern critical theory it's, it's, has emerged as its own account of justice, which is sharply different from the other three. And what he does in his article is he spends time describing it, showing some of the shortcomings of it, but also how does it contrast to the biblical view? And one of the things he does really well is revealing to us that every secular theory of justice may address some of the five facets of biblical justice, to some degree, they have concerns that they're trying to address. And they may address one or more of those biblical facets, but no secular theory of justice has addressed all five. You have to get to biblical justice to do that. And so he just does a great job, I think, outlining that, how biblical justice addresses all the concerns of justice that's found in all of these fragmented alternate views. And I just think he does it a good well. So, so I would just encourage you to do a couple things. One is read the article. I think it's extremely helpful. You can simply Google it. And uh, you can just put in there a biblical critique of, of a secular justice by uh, Tim Keller. Probably the first one that comes up is a link to gospelinlife.com. And that's the article that I read then that I still have today. And so I, I would recommend that to help you think through these things in the culture in which we live today. The other thing I would encourage you to do is just even to go back and listen to that sermon from October 18th of 2020. You can find it at youtube.com slash Northside Christian. And, and I think that, that this is helpful for us because what we want to make sure we do is in our worship of God, the most important thing we can do is to be aligned with the heart of God and to make sure that our application of, of justice is God's justice, his biblical justice, because none of the other theories will ascribe to absolute moral truth that comes from God. In fact, often can resist it. And so I want to encourage you to do that, which means I just want to close with two don'ts as you interact with justice. The first one is this. Don't chase a form of justice without God. They all fall short. There may be times that we stand shoulder to shoulder with someone who's concern for an issue aligns with God's heart and his concern. We may even find at times we're, we're holding hands with people working on an issue or a problem together that, that needs our attention, that is an act of unrighteousness or of injustice. We may find ourselves rubbing shoulders in those moments, but there are different levels of fellowship. And sometimes there may be a season where we're doing that in some way or some form, but that doesn't mean that, that you can align all of your resources and even align everything you have with them because they may divert from what God says at some point. They may not even believe in God. They may not even believe in the Bible as absolute authority. So some of that relationship is gonna be limited. The depth of fellowship is limited. There's degrees of fellowship by what we can align with God on. So we just need to make sure that we're not chasing a form of justice without God. Sure, we hold hand to hand on some issues when we can, but we have to understand we gotta stay true to the word. The second thing is don't dismiss biblical justice because you see the faults of secular justice. 
There is such a thing as biblical justice. So don't say, you know, I hate what was happening or what is happening in Portland or some other place. I don't like how they're doing it or what the, whatever. Just because some people might misuse it or abuse it doesn't mean we can throw out whole sections of, of the Bible because of how some people address justice, which means don't let these words that the Bible uses become trigger words. If someone says justice or injustice or prejudice, don't let it be a trigger word where suddenly you're defensive and we don't, we don't talk about that. Don't let that happen because they're biblical words that God addresses. We need to let justice come back to a biblical framework. And I think if a lot of us are honest, we've probably drifted into other frameworks that are not biblical, not what God would say. In fact, that has been my goal through this entire series of we've gone through the prophets where they address this topic, as you guys can see, over and over and over again. The goal has been that we allow the prophets of God to challenge us, stretch us, help us to act justly and rightly because that's who God is in his very identity and it's who we are to be in ours we have felt like this is a good time to address it because there's not some like major event going on where we feel like we're having to react. It's where we can say, what does God say about this? Let's lean in. Let's listen into what he says. I don't know that we've always done the best at leading the way in talking about justice issues. I know we haven't. But when we open up to Isaiah 58 and we read that God's people did not loosen the chains of injustice, did not untie the cords of the yoke. They did not set the oppressed free. They did not share food with the hungry. They did not provide the poor wanderer with shelter or clothe the naked. Even when they saw it, and because of that, because of that, God could not respond to them. God would not see them and listen to those prayers. And that's why today I want to encourage you to see them, be with them, and do for them what God's justice requires. Do for them what Jesus would do. And that is our prayer today. And I'm just going to ask right now that you would stand to your feet and here in a moment, we're going to watch a video as we go back into this song of, of worship. But I just want to ask in this moment that today, if you sense God prodding you to have eyes to see, that you would just respond and say, here I am, Lord. I want my worship to be that which you desire. Maybe today you want to make a decision. You want to pray with someone. You want to talk through someone. Maybe you want to make a decision to follow Jesus today. I'm going to be stepping out decision point. I would love to talk with you there. If you're watching online, just go to northsidechristianchurch.net slash decision to begin that conversation. And as you leave today, let this be an opportunity to give what God is doing through his church. And you can do that at the boxes at the back of the room or online or through text to give with the information you see on the screen. But my prayer right now, Lord, is that we would listen to you. We would submit ourselves to you. We would be obedient to what you have said to us today. And that God, our worship would be pleasing to you because we are loving people and going to the places that Jesus went, to the lost and the broken, that we would die to ourselves to live for you and sacrifice because that's the way of the cross. And I pray that you would move us to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the people of the world revere him. For the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him, our hearts rejoice as we trust His holy name. 
May your unfailing love be with us as we put our hope in you. From Psalm 33. 